it's noon or woo, at least, or 10 a.m. Um, second life time and various times your time. Um, always glad to see such a good uh, audience as this. We've got quite a few people here. Oh yeah, I have uh, one of those too, like uh, Texas Instrument, still have them. Okay, so uh, let's get uh, started here. Um, we have had a lot of really, really good presentations uh, about science. In other words, okay, if you look at STEM, STEM is the abbreviation for um, uh, science, technology. Yes, I'm typing engineering and math. And we've had some marvelous presentations, of course, in the area of science. We've had some fabulous, a couple of them in, in uh, math. We haven't had a lot in the technology and engineering uh, area. And so this one's about uh, technology and engineering. And I hope there's a couple engineers out there because I kind of need to pick your brain on a, a demo that I'm doing. <laughs> um, so let's go ahead and take a look at um, our subject today. And uh, I'd like to talk about not computers first today, uh, but uh, computers um, long ago and then working up today, because essentially there have been computers for a very long time. Anybody recognize this? I mean, you may not have seen it. It's in museum in Greece, but um, the Antikythera mechanism is dates to uh, more than 2,000 years ago. It's found in, it's about the size of, in other words, uh, they found it in that condition up there to the upper left. But um, after doing some uh, x-ray tomography on it, yeah, it is. Um, some, doing some x-ray tomography, they uh, were even more impressed with what it was. It's about 37 bronze gears. They found it in a, a box in a uh, ancient Greek um, cargo ship off the island of Antikythera. That's why the name in about 1901. And then... The shipwreck itself dates to about 60, 70 uh, BC, but it's estimated to the device to have been made in the time of um, Hipparchus, um, if I'm pronouncing that correct. And what it had was it had a lot of gears. You can see the uh, a model of it, um, and you can see dials in front and in back, and you turned a little handle, and there are a lot of gears that all mesh together. And based on the fact that it depicts a Sothic, in other words, a solar Egyptian calendar of 12 months of 30 days and five what are called intercalary days, intercalary days. Uh, yeah, uh, Stonehenge was a lot of things, and one of them, of course, was kind of an astronomical calculator. Um, but this was before the calendars we use today. Um, so in any case, what's fascinating about it is that well, the, the Shiloh, that's a good uh, question. And of course, the Egyptian calendar was uh, based on uh, the, it had both elements having to do with the um, Sirius, uh, because that's when the Nile would flood and other things on it. But essentially, most calendars, uh, here again, I'm, I don't want to get too much into calendars because I could easily do a whole presentation on calendars. But the idea was that they needed to know these things because of agriculture and other reasons. And um, so the winter wasn't a big deal, but, they, but the times of uh, planting and harvesting and stuff was a big deal. But in any case, the reason they know this data to that time period and that, that what makes this fascinating was the, this is a little computer, but uh, Hipparchus actually knew about the precession of orbits knew about differing velocities at, at perigee and apogee, that is the um, closest and furthest point of uh, elliptical orbits. I mean, all of that about 1,700 years before Kepler and others rediscovered this. And so that's what makes this quite quite fascinating uh, device. And you could essentially show the position of astronomical bodies for decades ahead and predict eclipses and all kinds of cool stuff using this um, calculator. Essentially, yeah, essentially a, um, yeah, 
uh, so we can talk about that too, <laughs> epicycles and so so on and so forth. But with ellipses, of course, you don't have to worry about epicycles. Okay, uh, another computer or calculator, if you want to call it, um, is an abacus. Has anyone ever used an abacus or ever seen one used? For me, uh, I'm looking for that in chat. Um, but for me, when I visited Russia about 20 years ago, um, I actually saw one in a store being used. And I know it's still used in a, yeah, a very fast. I mean, a lot of times, uh, yeah, and <laughs> uh, I'm aging myself, but yes, I used a slide rule. I, my first degree was chemistry, and I, before the first calculators came out, I definitely had a slide rule and used it uh, back 60s, 70s time period. Okay, but there's lots of, oh, I still have mine. And I have one from um, my uh, um, uh, stepdad and stuff like that from the 40s. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, we're talking, I'll be talking about quantum computers in a minute, quantum abacus. That's funny. Okay. Uh, so, in any case, these are different types of abacus. Uh, they've been used for uh, over 4,000 years, still being used, and they can do lots of different things. Things. I mean, basic arithmetic. Um, they can also be uh, do square and cube roots and a bunch of stuff like that. A rather fascinating little devices. They're kind of cool for setting. The one down on the bottom right is interesting because that's a calculator with an abacus that was made in Japan. And I thought that's the first time I ever seen that. And I thought, wow, that's pretty fascinating. Abacus app. I'm sure you can. In fact, if anybody finds it, I'd, lo I'd love to know where you where you get that. Okay, so here's another. Um, yeah, I never saw that either, so I thought that was kind of cool. Okay, so in any case, here's another uh, computer of sorts that is um, also been used for over 2,000 years, in some cases possibly longer, and this is an astrolabe. And I've got a picture of there over to the right. I hope the little demo in front doesn't uh, obscure that much. Um, oh, thank you. Um, okay, so these have been around for a very long time. In fact, in the, in the 900s before the common era, 900, no, I mean 900 common era, um, somebody suggested that perhaps there were over a thousand uses for this device. It was invented over 2,000 years ago. And today, you can I actually looked this up on Amazon. You can find an astrolabe watch. <laughs> and there are Swiss, make, Swiss watchmakers and Dutch watchmakers that both make, um, yeah, OK. And what Shiloh mentioned right there is uh, using this device, you could tell time based on the stars. Now, later, when there were more accurate timing devices, but you're talking about the 16, 1700s and such, these became a little less common, but basically everyone could use uh, these if you're doing any kind of uh, need for time uh, and such like that. And there essentially, there's a main disk which marks the hours and often degrees or a compass, and then it's got a disk which is specific to the latitude of that area, which can be taken out, and so you can change it for latitudes. It's got a stereographic uh, projection of the 3D dimensional night sky with the North Star in the center, and then there's a rotating disk called the REIT, which then contains the ecliptic and path of planets, and what you do is kind of look at the latitude of, the, of a prominent star, uh, turn the REIT, match it all up, and you can actually tell the time on the outside. Very fascinating. Um, one of the things I like about stuff like this is it shows just how fascinating uh, people think. In other words, you take science and then you use it, which is what technology and engineering uh, is. Okay, if anyone's actually used some of these devices or seen them, please let me know. Yeah, arithmetic rendered um, easier with good symbolism, etc. Absolutely. A geometrical understanding. And that's part of what all this is. In other words, people using some of these devices had to actually know it. They didn't just click and point and, and do things. You know, they actually had to know how it, it worked. And, and that's what's fascinating. And it's also what's fascinating having to uh, teach and learn about 
uh, stuff like this is learning. Okay, um, how many are familiar with this item? What I found out just this week was that actually, uh, oh yeah, is that I found out just this week is that the Q-U-I-P-U is the spelling, Spanish spelling, but the K-H-I-P-U is the spelling based on the Native American language, um, basically. And by the way, I've got a little, if you want to see some, let me share these with you. I'm watching my time. I've got an hour to tell you all about how computers work. Uh, um, so this is the Kapu one. And let me see one. This is a uh, one having to do with astrolabes. It's actually a little TED talk, um, which is fascinating. If you if you listen to some of those talks, they're they're rather fascinating. Uh, here's one. It's actually a little mini course on how to use an abacus. Uh, by the way, uh, somebody mentioned slide rule. I've got a video on how to use a slide rule that I'll have to show you sometime. Um, I, I think I actually did that once. I think I had a presentation here on slide rules or, or analog computers anyway. So, I, so some of these I've kind of, uh, this is deja vu, uh, kind of uh, talked about in the past. Uh, but I need to talk a little bit about these because essentially... Um, this is how the modern computer got uh, started. Now, here is the next one I'm going to talk about, which is, uh, yes, in fact, um, that's a good point. Thanks, Suzuki. Is, is these were used for uh, looking at uh, genealogy, taxes, payments, calendar information, military organization. Um, they even had what they think is... Um, uh, zip codes, essentially, in other words, numbers representing villages and such, so they could keep track of, of that. The girls all liked your slide roll, huh? <laughs> okay, let's see. Okay, so uh, before we get here, by the way, on the on the one before here, I mean, I got to watch my time. On the one before here, um, the knots were in uh, base ten, whereas in the um, North America, uh, they use base 20. And so you've got, for example, the number 731 would be seven simple knots, three simple knots, and what's called a figure eight knot representing a one. What they haven't figured out is why there's colors and branches and stuff like that. A lot of that was lost because a lot of these were destroyed uh, by the conquistadors because they thought they were um, pagan. Okay. Yeah. Anything you don't understand. Okay. So now this is on the Babbage engines here, which is the next one I'm going to show you. Uh, whoops. Not. Uh, I, I skipped ahead. This is the uh, programmable loom. And essentially, this is based on some earlier um, ideas. But essentially, math, but essentially, with the loom, you've got the the first real product of the Industrial Revolution was textiles, and so they were in, in high demand. And so, how do you then get more of them and uh, able to do twenty four hours a day and not have to hire? skilled people, well, you program it into a loom using cards. And so essentially you've got these punch cards which contain holes that control uh, controlled, uh, control rods and then uh, it can control the warp and the weft and the little hooks and stuff like that. If you've ever seen, I've seen looms, hand looms that uh, Native Americans actually uh, uh, used and down in uh, Mexico and places. Um, yeah, okay. And I actually, I believe I actually saw one of these in China back in the early 80s. Um, 
and they're still used in some places. Yes, yeah, uh, all of all of what. Uh, take a look at the um, the text. There's some. There's some very. Yeah, that's exact. Yeah, Shiloh's uh, the Zappa text down in uh, Oaxaca and, and places. Um, okay, so in any case, this thing automates the weaving process. Uh, and the there's a picture to the lower right there that actually shows a picture of Jacquard who uh, invented this, and it's made from 24,000 punch cards. It's actually a little uh, portrait of him in silk. Uh, pretty fascinating. And these things are still uh, used today. Um, now the next one here is the Babbage engines, and these were actually the only part. Only parts of these were made. Up, upper left there is one section of this. But in 2002, um, one of them was actually made based on the design, and it worked. And then the one down at the bottom was actually the designed to be the first programmable mechanical general purpose computer, which we'll talk about here in a minute, is what occurred was essentially mathematical tables were calculated by hand in the 1700s, 1800s, and stuff used for engineering, finance, navigation, astronomy, and Charles Babbage reproduced some of these and found that there were a lot of errors in it. And so uh, he wanted to produce a machine because these were important to finance and navigation, engineering and stuff. He wanted to invent machines that didn't make an error uh, and could do tabulate. This particular machine can calculate numbers out to 31 decimal places, by the way, and so, or at least um, significant figures. Yeah, I don't think he meant <laughs> worked in a, in a theater. Uh, most of the people that did stuff like this were rather well off and didn't have to work. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Okay, so in any case, speaking of well often didn't have to work, um, uh, Babbage popcorn, never heard of that one. Okay, so Ada Lovelace, you may have heard of, and she was an acquaintance of Babbage, and she published some notes that gave step-by-step -step instructions for how the different engine would work. And where she's really, she's actually known as the first uh, computer programmer for that. Yeah, Ada Lovelace. There's actually a programming language in the 80s that was used by the U.S. military called ADA. Um, and so she speculated, though, that these machines, absolutely, she speculated that these machines could not only, I mentioned her when I was talking about the uh, unsung heroes, basically uh, women in STEM. And so she speculated that these things could not only do numerical calculations, but that they could also use numbers to represent things like letters and musical notes. And then you could manipulate these with rules. That was, um, well, she, not perhaps the first programming language, but she was considered the first programmer because she did a step-by-step -step algorithm for how this works. And that's essentially how, what programming languages are. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, so, her idea that you could use numbers to represent, hang on to this because I'll be talking about it, is uh, to represent numbers and musical notes and stuff like that and manipulate these was far ahead of her time. And so the first programmable language was essentially a uh, century after uh, that thought uh, in, the, in the 1950s rather than uh, in the 1850s. And so um, this was quite a, a breakthrough in thought now, the analytical engine was designed to use punch cards. Have we seen those? In fact, the same ones essentially as the Jacquard loom and go through the same sorts of cycles. And so it's essentially, even though it was never built, uh, essentially considered the first um, design for, for a modern um, general purpose uh, computer. Uh, okay. Okay, so this one here, Hallrath was a German immigrant uh, to the United States, and he, uh, in the 1880 census, essentially it took five years. Okay, let, let me go back. 
the U.S. Constitution requires that a census of the population be conducted every 10 years. It determines voter representation, government aid distribution, all, lots of different stuff. And so back in 1880, it took five years to collect the data or, of the population and then another four years to manually tabulate it by hand. Okay, that's nine years. In other words, almost. So essentially, there was a great influx of immigrants, particularly uh, from Europe in the uh, 1800, in the 1880s. And so by 1890, the population of the U.S. had grown uh, considerably so that they wouldn't even be able to do the census in a decade had it not been for Hollerith. What Hollerith did was uh, pe people still took about five years to collect the data um, by hand, of course, going around, you know, talking. But then, like the ladies here in the upper left, um, translated that data into cards, which were then put on the machine, and the electrical connection then would uh, increment the count by one in the category um, that was given. So essentially, it only took a year and a half then instead of four years. So the whole thing was Im improved by about six and a half years, which was a considerable improvement. Now, the interesting thing is Hollerith created a company that merged with another one in 1911 and then was renamed IBM in 1924. Uh, you've probably heard of IBM. I've been moved. <laughs> okay. Well, that too. International business machines was not what they called it back in 1924. Um, but, you know, IBM today. Okay. So general purpose computers. Let's take a look at that. What, what we mean by that is essentially before the computers that were, um, yes, uh, Mike and I first learned to program with cards <laughs> on an IBM 360 in the, and did Fortran 4 uh, in the 60s, uh, just to, just to uh, age myself a bit. Absolutely. So uh, the devices that we've looked at before all do one specific thing, whether it's calculate, you know, the uh, model, what the solar system's gonna look like, or tabulate cards, or run a loom, and such like that. But what we mean by, uh, what we mean by, actually I still have a, uh, some cards uh, wrapped up. They usually, what you do is you put them out, a key punch, uh, put a little rub, rubber band around, give them to the operator. I still got several of those from uh, when I was doing this. Okay, so in any case, a general purpose computer is one that you could program to perform a number of things. And so the first, there was also a version called Colossus in uh, the UK, uh, but in the US, uh, ENIAC, uh, what, Electronic Numerical Integrated Computer was the first um, general purpose computer. Pencil, oh no, what's a pencil? Yeah, I understand. Um, <laughs> okay, so um, it was the first general purpose computer, and in World War II, it was used to calculate uh, tables of uh, trajectories for shells for battleships and artillery, and also to do a little um, theoretical work on uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, essentially, what the women were doing in that picture is they're connecting various parts of the machine with cables, uh, much like uh, switchboard operators did. And then vacuum tubes were the, what was used back then before transistors cr to create um, ones and zeros. Um, and Susan G, I guess your analog, your, excuse me, your um, avatar would not know what first life or real life is. I hate calling it real life because Hopefully this is real life. Otherwise, what am I doing um, here? Uh, all of the avatars are actually connected to real life people. Okay, so in any case, uh, vacuum tubes were used to connect to, this is real life, absolutely. That's what I tell my students every once in a while. I'll go, okay, when you're in real life, and I'm, I'm going, oops, sorry, hopefully school is real life too. <laughs> Otherwise, what are they doing here? It's, school is not just a, a, a 
place to do stuff before you go to real life. Um, okay, so in any case, ones and zeros were used in binary arithmetic to store results of the calculations, to make calculations and stuff. So before computers were in common use, uh, computer was the title for a job. In fact, anyone seen the movie Hidden Figures? Very good movie. Here again, I know they, yes, yes, okay, good. I got to make sure that uh, people other than just the um, text chatters are out there. <laughs> and also that I'm still being heard. Okay, but marvelous uh, movie. So essentially, one of the fascinating things from a computer standpoint was that movie was made. Now, it was compressed because they're, they're essentially talking about one time period, but it, it extended over about 10 years. But uh, human computers were being replaced by electronic ones. Of course, the movie is fascinating, and I don't want to spoil it if you want to watch it or the book about why um, it was important to have human um computers or calculators at the time. Um, I'm reading tagline saying, yeah, uh, particularly, uh, absolutely, when you're talking about vacuum tubes, uh, they had to warm up. <laughs> it wasn't um, the, okay, the importance of the vacuum tube, at, which I'll show you here in a minute, was, in fact, if you look on this slide, you can kind of see it, is what computers do is they use binary arithmetic, essentially on and off. They're, they're electrical switches, like a light switch. And in the ones we, yeah, zero, one, et cetera. But there's really no, in other words, if you cut open a, a, a line in a computer, there's no ones and zeros that fall out. Uh, they're essentially represented by electrical current being present or not. Now, that's a very simple way to put it. In fact, actually, that's my next slide. Um, Speaking of three states, uh, if you, uh, we'll talk about quantum computers here at the end. But these computers essentially went from vacuum tubes, which represented the ones and zeros, or could control electricity going on or off, to transistors, which then, instead of uh, a three ton, eight foot tall um, monster, um, yep, he did back. Uh, early 50s, late 40s, something like that. But you had transistors, which then did it, and then integrated circuits after that. And so let's take a look at that. By the way, punch cards. <laughs> In other words, we're still using it. So essentially, let's take a look at the next one, is creating ones and zeros. In other words, computers, like I said, essentially were very, very simple concept of simply switches. In other words, electricity turning on and off. Vacuum tubes were used at the very beginning, and then transistors became smaller and smaller and smaller. You will note on the upper right there that, uh, no. <laughs> oh, excuse me. <clears throat> that made me laugh. Okay, so up, upper right there, transistors are actually becoming so small um, now that it's only nanometers across. Um, when we get to quantum computers, I'll tell you how they're resolving that. But your, your basic processor that you probably have on your laptop or the one I'm using right now has uh, several billion uh, transistors uh, in it. They're able to do things like second life. Okay, and also the integrated circuits that made them smaller and smaller, what are called, what's called uh, photolithography. That's in uh, another, <laughs> if you want to uh, look at that, that's kind of another um, chip manufacturing. What I'm looking for is a video. There's some great videos on how this is, chips are actually uh, manufactured. Okay. Let's see, don't let me go past if there's uh, questions and stuff like that. But it is, in what they're again saying is essentially it's the precise control of individual electrons. And what actually happens, and there, like I said, there's some uh, great videos. In fact, actually the YouTube I have on there of the chip manufacturing process, let me see if I can 
uh, find the slide that that's on because it's worth watching to see how this is actually done. It's it's uh, a kind of a, an amazing um, engineering feat to do this. So let me put that in here. If you want to take a look at that? That's a video of how this is actually done. In other words, how compute how computer chips are made. But you're right. There's a precise movement. Uh, uh, control of movement of individual electrons, essentially whether electricity is on or off, um, and what a one or a zero is uh, to begin with, and it's very very precise and, and it's it's quite uh, amazing. Okay, so um, let's take a look then at the next is now back in 1965 actually. Gordon Moore, who at one time was the CEO of Intel, he also founded Fairchild uh, uh, Semiconductors, et cetera, et cetera, okay, whatever. He noted that there was a trend in computer performance, essentially the number of transistors that you could put on a chip. Now, a chip is a what we usually call an integrated circuit. And so he noticed that it doubled every 18 to 24 months. And so... This is actually kind of a, yeah, this is kind of a self-fulfilling self uh, goal or <laughs> prophecy. So it's not really, when we talk about Moore's law, it's not a law so much as a self-fulfilling goal. And But essentially, we've been able to continue to do it for, uh, what, 50 years or more. And you can see some of the uh, computers over the, um, time period. Yeah, the trend, okay, uh, and, and I'm glad you asked questions here because I often don't know, is a transistor is what holds the data on the chip. It's basically the transistor makes the ones or zeros. Now, in fairness, a transistor actually can't hold data. What you actually have, say, for example, in RAM is a matrix of transistors, one over the other, that can actually hold uh, data in RAM, but that's another that's another <laughs> story we can get into the uh, um, presentation. Speaking of speed, by the way, when you when if you look on the slide there and it says five or hundred megahertz um, or sixty or four gigahertz, what you're talking about is the number of operations that could be conducted in a second or the clock speed. If you want to think of it that way. So 4 GHz, 4 gigahertz is 4 billion operations that can be formed in a second. That's amazing. I can remember when I bought an Apple in 78, is the, the speed was 4 megahertz. <laughs> okay. Um, very, very, very slow at that time. Okay. Um, Okay, if I if I remember correctly. So essentially central processes, what they've done is since about 2000, they thought at the time that they might not be able to make it any faster because it was essentially melt or burn up. And so that's why you've got the fans and aluminum uh, wicks, essentially, if you look at a computer that are on processors today. Uh, and so what they did was they kind of went to multiple cores. So you see up in... 2006, where it says dual core, and now, of course, we've got i7, i9s, whatever, in the Intel range with multiple cores. So instead of one microprocessor doing all the work, essentially it's divided among a number of cores in order to be able to continue to uh, work faster and faster and faster according to Moore's law. That's kind of how it works that way. Um, yeah, the Commodore 128, which I happen to have a copy in my garage, or, or one in my garage, uh, very slow, but hey, we thought it was fast back in those times. Um, but as I pointed out in one of the earlier slides, let me see if I can go back real quick, is the transistor in the upper right there um, is only nanometers. In other words, we're getting down to at atomic size. It's only a few atoms across in the middle there, which is an important area. So 
we're getting to a point where it's going to be really difficult to continue Moore's law if we don't do something about it. Uh, and current transistor technology is going to be hard to do it. Although I read recently about a five nanometer or two nanometer um, transistor, and I have no idea how that works, but we'll take a look at it. Okay, next, I've got 25 minutes uh, for my presentation if I'm going to keep to the hour. Okay, so essentially here's how it works. So why are ones and zeros important? Because, um, well, says G, you're right, and not only that, but quantum effects. In other words, you get down to you get down to the atom size, and you start getting unpredictable things going on. Uh, whereas it, the probability is not uh, hundred percent that you have a one or a zero. It could be um, both, which we will take a look at when we talk about quantum computers. Qubits, exactly. You're you're preceding my slides here by about six or seven. So let's take a look at this first. Okay, this is important because my my, no, 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 that's good. I'm glad you're thinking ahead here. Um, but this presentation is on how computers work. And so um, I've given you kind of a, an idea of uh, how older computers work. And then now let me tell you why the ones and zeros. Well, essentially, computers work with binary, um, which means two states or a one or a zero. If you look at the upper left there, numbers are interesting because they can be represented by different bases. And here again, this can be a whole hour in itself, but the number 678, which we use base 10 to represent, in base 16, that is 2A6. Don't ask, don't ask me quite yet how that works. A stands for 10, and then F stands for 15. <laughs> but that's, a, like I said, that's another, um, presentation. Uh, but in binary, it's 101010110, which is a really long way to say 678. Uh, but that's how 678 is stored in a computer and transmitted. Now, how do language symbols stored also? Well, somebody had to come up with a table. Um, today, it, nowadays, it's, it's called Unicode. It used to be called the first ones in the 60s. Uh, ASCII could pretty much show the uh, European language, but could not show, like, does anyone know what language that is? Um, okay, Katya, that's a very interesting thing. EMP is a risk of losing all this data. However, come, if you use vacuum tube, you not. And I could go into that um, interesting fact. Um, also, uh, would take a little while to explain some. Of okay, but in case, yeah, okay, so you can explore limits. Let's see, computer pattern terms base two, uh, data by seeing how many digits you get for, say, two. Oh, yeah, or, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so does anyone happen to know what language? In other words, under the number, under that red numbers on there on the slide, there's a language symbol. And I don't know what language that is, but that's a symbol in a language. I think it may be somewhere one of the uh, languages in India or that area, but essentially that group of, is it Sanskrit? Oh, thank you. Okay, see, I didn't know that. Okay, well, I would get, <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> okay. Um, but essentially uh, it's stored, what, it, what I'm getting at is that everything in the computer, okay, if you, if you learn nothing today, everything in the computer is stored as ones and zeros. Okay, which then again are just stored as, you know, electricity on, electricity off, or other ways of storing what's a one or zero. Here again, that's a very simple slide way of describing it. But that language symbol is a bunch of ones and zeros, a pattern of ones and zeros, the numbers are ones and zeros, a color, that bluish looking color in the upper right is just a bunch of ones and zeros. Now that's in hex which means that essentially you're looking at 24 ones and zeros in, in, but that would take a while to put it across there. Yeah, ooh, very good, okay. Uh, yeah, I had to check to make sure I did it right. Because <laughs> I did that by hand. Or sounds are also stored as ones and zeros. Now that is a, a Icelandic word 
meaning happy, like happy to see you. Uh, I think it's pronounced show. <laughs> um, but essentially, you'll see everything we say, just like what I'm doing right now, is frequencies or amplitudes. It's a, it's, it's, it's a collection uh, or essentially a sequence of frequencies and amplitudes. And you can assign values uh, to frequencies and amplitudes uh, the same way you can to others. So essentially everything on your computer, if you think about it, is numbers, language, colors, or sounds. And that's how the computer actually works. Images are just grids of color. Uh, videos are just rapidly changing images. So essentially this slide here tells you pretty much how most of this stuff works, including in Second Life. <laughs> okay. But uh, so now that you have music from the keyboard. Okay, so now that you have um, an idea of how things are stored in the computer, how then do these chips communicate? Well, you got to have a board or something for them to uh, send electricity from one to the other. Uh, if you've ever looked at a circuit board, it's not just the front and the back. It's a lot more complicated than that. And there's a little diagram over to the right that shows essentially is like a really, Really, really complicated road system where there are where you don't want to hit each other because it needs to be insulated because you're talking about electricity. But in other words, uh, these little traces and why things kind of go in and don't come out and that sort of thing is because it's a it's a very complicated uh, pattern. I have some friends in California who actually do this for a living, design these uh, for a living, and so the components essentially have to then talk about it. and so. The reason you could go from the ENIAC, which had 18,000 vacuum tubes and 10,000 resistors and 70,000 or capacitors and 70,000 resistors and hundreds of kilometers of wire and all of that stuff and did only 5,000 hertz was the speed uh, to a chip in 1995 that actually did what the ENIAC did. Rather amazing. Okay, uh, so that's how that works. Now, the one other thing that's important here is that the electrical pathways are used. In other words, you're just talking about electricity, one way, electricity. And so you, sometimes you're sending addresses, sometimes controls like, you know, print this or say this or give me a copy of this uh, and data. And so there are different, it's kind of a, a bus system where in the computer where things work. Now, here's kind of, I'm going to talk about computer logic. And that's why my little demo is here. Is essentially in a computer, if it doesn't matter whether you're using Second Life, whether you're using uh, word processing or game or whatever, is that essentially you're doing some of the types of stuff that you see on the screen. In other words, copy what you find in this location. Do this until this condition is met. If the user presses a key or whatever, execute this function, add, delete this number, uh, compare this, uh, all this sort of stuff. Now, that's computer logic. So how does that actually work? Well, let's take a look at that. Is that I'm going to get a little deep in here, here again, and I'm trying to explain how a computer works in one hour. <laughs> So, for you, do we have any electricians, engineers, computer scientists, other stuff in the audience today? We do. Oh, goody. Then tell me if I'm, in other words, correct me if I say something wrong. But, uh, <laughs> yay, computer scientists. Okay, so this is kind of fun uh, trying to explain some of this to when I do it to students, but essentially if you look at these little, what are called logic gates, uh, and how they work, this is, this is where the amazing part comes in. And you've got a couple diagrams there that actually show, okay, use these resistors, use these transistors, uh, whatever they don't have the, and, and you can actually make a gate that does the logic, at least when you put electricity through it, then what comes out as far as the where the little LED lights up or whatever is the logic of these computer um, gates and then circuits. Over to the right, what you see is essentially four chips that have a combination of uh, logic gates in them 
that will do uh, simple addition. And I'm going to show you there how this works. Partly it's this demo, and i got to watch my time because right now it looks like I may go slightly over, but I'm trying not to. Um, but essentially, if you follow programming rules and these little logic things, you could do stuff like a simple uh, calculation. Okay, so let me see when I want to do a pres uh, show you what the demo looks like. Okay. Um, okay, here's the next part of that. So this part here is about, okay, this part here is about the logic gate circuits, chips, and stuff like that needed to perform simple thing like a two plus three equals five in binary. Two is the one and zero. Uh, three is the one one. In other words, a two and a one is a three. Five is a four and a and no twos and a one. So four and a one is five. That, that's the binary equivalents of these uh, de um, decimal numbers. And so now. What does your processor look like inside? This is a very simple one. And uh, let me give you, this is a fascinating YouTube if you want to see how your processor actually works. This is a very, very simple version of an early processor to show how it works. But it actually steps through the whole thing to show how um, a processor works. And I will kind of do that a little bit on the slides here in half a second. But essentially, inside your processor, the one that says CPU in the, in the middle there, there's a control unit. Uh, there, are what are, there is what's called an ALU, or arithmetic logic unit, which does the types of things that I'm, I showed you with the uh, logic gates and stuff. In other words, essentially, since everything is a number, or ones and zeros inside a computer, what you're doing is a lot of comparing, and which is logic, or arithmetic, uh, which is you know the addition, subtraction, and you can also do multiplication, division, uh, using addition, subtraction, using different logic, whatever, blah blah. Okay, uh, but that's what's inside your little uh, CPU. So let's take a look at what we would do then to add two and three. Well, this is kind of how it would work in the CPU itself. Essentially, you would go, OK, I need some instructions. Uh, good. <laughs> and plus, they will be out there um, for you. Uh, but um, so the little CPU is sitting there. The, the processor sitting there goes, I need some instructions. And so it goes to look. You can see the address there, 011. Uh, 0001, which is uh, the red represents electricity going through the wire, the green represents it not going through the wire. Uh, yeah, I can remember that too, <laughs> four kilobytes. Um, and so we're talking about those time periods where essentially you have an 8 bit address rather than 32 or 64 or even 16. Uh, the 32 or 64 is what we have nowadays, where you'd have like 32 wires or 64, not eight, like what you see here. This is from a while back. Okay, but it's easy to understand it if we look at it from a while back. And so essentially, you'd go to the address. You can see it in gray over there that you'd send a little address on the address bus, you'd send the address to the first. Uh, address there that's in gray, and the actual contents of that address then would be copied. If you send a what's called a, a little pulse down the enable wire, you're saying give me a copy off, and so it would copy zero one zero one uh, zero one one, which I just made up. That that's the uh, instruction set for add. <laughs> um, uh, and you'd send that down to the CPU and also to the screen so you could see what's going on. Um, and then it would then copy that. Uh, and then you'd get the first number, which would be two, and the second number, which would be three, uh, which those are the actual numbers for two and three there. In other words, it's in the second and third address. 
and then you'd write it, say, to the fourth address in, in, that, in, in that address. Well, what you would do, uh, count the pixels? <laughs> okay, now, what, what actually happens is, of course, and this is important to know about computers, is computers only do, they don't multitask. They multi-thread. In other words, they do one thing, and then they do another, and they do another. They can do them billions of times a second. But essentially, um, yeah, yeah, Minecraft has some fascinating things exactly like this. In other words, you can actually go into Minecraft and see huge displays uh, where somebody is, 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 uh, has made a mini computer out of uh, circuits. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Uh, but that's somebody who really knew what they're talking about, right? Okay, so essentially then you copy. So, so for example, you have an operation called add. And then, so now the computer knows. Well, the computer doesn't really know how to do add unless it goes into its construction set. It goes, okay, add means take a number and, you know, add it to the other one. But essentially they, they want to know what you're going to do. So it goes over to the, the address, gets the uh, operator, which is add, brings it back, go, oh, Hey, I'm ready. Uh, add means I got to have two numbers. So you go get the first number, you go get the second number. After that, you add them together and then you put the result in here. Now that's what's happening on the larger scale, so to speak. Ah, okay. I can't translate that, but uh, that's cool. <laughs> okay. I'm not a computer. That's machine language. Um, where, okay. Watch your layer. <laughs> yeah, very, very funny. Okay, so let's take a look at how this works. Okay, so this is what would be happening in the processor. But what would be happening in the arithmetic logic unit? Well, essentially this. If you actually traced it through, finish. <laughs> okay, if you actually traced it through, take a look down there at the bottom right. and You see two is a one or a zero. And then go up to the upper left. And so the first digit then is a zero. And then a three is a one and one. And so you're finished. <laughs> okay. We got some funny people here in, in uh, Sign Circle. Okay. It's almost, it's almost as fun to watch the, the, the chat as it is <laughs> uh, what's going on here in the slides. Okay. So you, so essentially just like you would do it in, in so-called real life, um, if you added two and three, essentially you'd be adding those and then seeing if you carried over to the next one, that sort of thing. So that's what you're seeing up there, is that you'd put in a zero, you'd put in a one, and the one is the red lines, zero is the green lines, and so you use an or uh, logic gate and then an and logic gate, and there's one, something called a not, and essentially you're, you're adding these up and you get a one, okay? Uh, in other words, a one and a zero ends up being a one. And then you carry zero. Um, and I'm not going to go through all of these, but essentially it, you can. If you take a look at these, you can go through all of these. And you get the answer being one, zero, one, which is a five. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and Syzygy, that's really the story here is that it's involved, but there's two things going on. One is all that's all that's happening is electricity being on or off. That's a one or a zero. Uh, there are these little electronic circuits. It's not magic that make that happen. The magic part, as far as I'm concerned, is the engineers, the computer scientists that design this thing using the logic of arithmetic rules. So uh, we can do this in our head because our head is way better than any computers. Uh, but being able to actually do this in electronic circuitry is what I think is the, the miracle. And so this is, this is essentially down to the um, circuit level how two and two is added up. Now, Keeping in mind that we are getting up to the hour. Um, yeah, and we, we, we do put stuff in memory. We 
draw information on what a two or a three is. We draw information on what it means to add, uh, but we do a lot more than that. In other words, it, just talking about how the human brain works, I could probably get with Tagline or uh, Max or other people on some of that. But the idea is that when we say apple, it's not just apple, but we may see an apple. We may see some different kinds of apples. We may see the word apple in your language or in different languages. We may smell an apple. We may taste the apple. We may have associations with the apple about when our first apple or our last apple. I mean, the human brain is, is much more complicated than uh, a computer. And it is. It's amazing that complexity can be achieved in very, very simple things. And that's really uh, the takeaway to this whole thing. Is what I wanted to show you was it's not a, a magic. <laughs> it's simply really good engineering and science behind the thing. Um, and you can become the apple, be one with the apple. Okay, so let's take a then the let's take a look then about what do we do about transistors becoming the size of atoms? Well, what do we do for you guys that uh, know this stuff? What's the next step? Yeah, that's it. In other words, instead of having something that's nanometers in size, why not use a single atom and use electrons to indicate one or zero? Essentially, one orbit uh, or energy level and another uh, energy level to represent a one or zero. So that's essentially what we're happening in quantum computers. So you can, now there's, there's a, um, did I write that? <laughs> no, I'm pretty sure I, hopefully I wrote exotic. Um, <laughs> you just have a interesting mind. <laughs> Wait a second, hang a second. Oh, exotic. Okay, boy, you, you're playing games with me. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> we can see what's on your mind. Okay, so... Uh, oh, I had it right. <laughs> okay. Um, so in any case, with quantum computers, you're using single, in, now in some cases, it's electron energy, but you can also do quantum computers with other stuff. But, but um, and that's a very good question. And uh, yeah, that's another one for another time. But let's, most computer things are somewhat 2D. Um, yeah, this is rather fascinating, Q, uh, and we can get into qubits, but when you get into actually qubits, what you're talking about is quantum states down at the thing, where essentially you don't have just a one or a zero. You essentially have both at the same time, and then it depends on what's going on as far as the instructions as to what the outcome is, whether it's a one or a zero. The other thing, and, and if you, you want to, uh, well, now, interesting thing about the Heisenberg uh, is the reason for that is because remember I said a computer, electronic computer can only do one thing at a time. It can do lots, you know, uh, in other words, it can do lots of things very fast, billions of things a second, but a quantum computer can literally do a million things a second. It all depends on how many qubits. In this case, D-Wave is a company that uh, has uh, quantum computers and IBM uh, is working on them too, but they only have, instead of uh, billions of processors, essentially are transistors, you only have, like in this case, 128. That's amazing, though, because these little qubit things, you can do millions of things a second. So it's a 128 cubic quantum processor. You're starting, to, you pretty soon, quantum computers will outmatch any electronic computer that there is, and then they'll go way beyond that to essentially outmatching our brains uh, in the near future. Um, this, is the, this is the future right here. Now, the problem with that is that people find is that that's also how security works, essentially. You know, if you try to guess a, a number, uh, if you do it serial-wise, and, you know, you, you're trying to guess one number and then the next and then the next, it's going to take a long time. 42? <laughs> okay, so, um, but if you can do millions of guesses every second, you can break codes. And that's going to be, in other words, we're going to have to think about 
how to do security with quantum computers. Okay, the other thing that, uh, and, uh, and I, this is my, one of my next to last slides, so I'm getting there, um, but I ha just have a little demo to do, is DNA chips. They're also thinking, well, how do we do stuff in 3D? DNA is marvelous about um, collecting data in a very small area in 3D. And so they, they're using, instead of two ones or zeros, essentially, it's base four, exactly. It's base four because it uses the four bases. <laughs> uh, that, I hadn't thought of that, that's funny. It, it, to uh, represent uh, information, and then it can store it. It's a little harder to manipulate DNA than it is atoms. So, this, so it hasn't progressed quite as far, but DNA computers have, have done some interesting stuff. Okay, so that's uh, my presentation, but let me just show you something, and here's why I need an engineer out there, because um, what I've got here is um, I'm trying to think about how to, I could program this, okay, in, say, uh, Second Life program, but um, how, has anyone ever played with physical objects? In other words, objects which actually... Thing, things kind of never. Ooh, yes. Okay. My next presentation, I think, is going to be on physical objects, and I'm going to have a lot of like hands-on. You guys are going to have to do stuff uh, and and play with these. In fact, actually, that oh, it's absolutely fascinating. Physics uh, physics objects are physical objects. They actually have, for example, um, soccer leagues in Second Life, where you can have a. a a ball that uh, behaves the physics of just as a soccer ball would, uh, or golf. <laughs> well, I don't know about golf, but golf would be a good one to have. So, um, okay, and I'm almost done, and, and I'm done with actually my presentation, but I want to show you something that kind of came up, volleyball, exactly. Okay, so what I mean by a physical object is this. Let's take a look at the green one in the middle. If I, uh, for you guys to do any, um, um, Watch what happens. If I go in and edit this and click on physical and then let it go, watch what happens. Boink, boink, boink. And you can control what type of stuff it is and how it, you know, how rubbery it is and all that stuff. Now, what actually happens here then is you can use this as a physical object. In other words, I can kick it. <laughs> boink. And you can then, use, and it will bounce around and go into objects and stuff like that. Uh, well, if I do the same thing right here, what I'm trying to do is to show you how I might use physical objects to represent a uh, and an OR gate. Okay, and so let's take a look at that. Is an in an OR gate? Um, and let me see. I may have to go out here because otherwise I get. Um, yeah. Okay. There we go. Second so I don't like to have my back to people, but on the OR gate, watch this. Essentially, if it's a one or a zero, the, the uh, a zero is not is say nothing, and a one is a red ball. So if I make this physical, watch what happens. What, what's going to happen? In other words, if you simply have a one and a zero, or zero, whatever, what should happen on an OR gate? Anybody happen to know who happens to be a computer science out there? Anybody know? Okay. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so watch. Okay, so now click. Ooh, ah, there it comes out the OR gate. Now, uh, exactly. Okay, now on the end, though, what happens? If I simply drop one through, what's going to happen on, the, on this one? Yeah, watch. Okay. Boink. <laughs> Okay, but if I have two ones and zeros, what happens? And, and I'm looking for June to, if you have, if you have two up, uh, yeah, go through, watch. Boing. Uh, <laughs> I, I haven't quite, so yeah, I'm working on this. Yeah, it rolls off. <laughs> Uh, so essentially, I'm working on this, uh, but if I have any engineers, what I'm trying to do, I, I, like I said, you could, yeah, you have a rollover. Okay, but I'm playing with this, and so I'm 
what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to uh, essentially build this and let's see, where's it, where's it that? Build this here. Uh, back, back, back. Like that. I'm trying to build this in Second Life. So, um, yeah, uh, lots, of, lots more fun. Um, <laughs> okay, and why is the other object here? By the way, I had to build a cage because otherwise I'd roll around. So there's a little, that's what the circle is. So I have to. Now, what is this here for? This is because uh, for people that were here last time, um, that's the cannon. Yes. Okay. The reason being is for people last time, um, what number is this? Um, what number is this? In other words, how many presentations have we given now for people that were here last week in the key D? <laughs> Yeah, 501. So what the candidate is, it's celebrating uh, 500. Um, there we go. It's celebrating 500 uh, presentations and 500 more to come. So it's a little uh, fireworksy thing. Yay. <laughs> okay, yeah, and that's the end of my presentation. So you can send off your own fireworks here. <laughs> as well <laughs> but i thought it was appropriate that we that we celebrate that and uh just like ones and zeros i've got to stop this otherwise it's going to continue with the, the fireworks <laughs> so now it's stopped okay i hope you enjoyed the presentation uh, like i said next time around i think I, what i'll do is actually have some really fun stuff with um physical objects so that way you guys can all get involved there's some cool stuff you could do with physical objects. Otherwise, have a great day. Any questions? Yeah, we haven't had, like I said, I haven't had a lot of technology or engineering presentations, so it's cool. Yeah, thank you. If you want to know more, just look, you know where I'm at. Oh, si oh, yes, Science Fair. Thanks, Shiloh. Uh, si uh, Shiloh is looking for presenters in the Science Fair, which is uh, June 26th, is that? Okay, yeah, there is. Uh, uh, now, let's see. Okay, there is. Um, uh, okay, at the Science Circle site, um, we will or, or, or will soon have some information about the science fair. And the idea is you create one object that represents a science concept or whatever. So there will be some information. We have information now. Yes, if somebody could put the link, that'd be helpful. Okay, I was looking at where that up, where that is, but the yeah, science fair right here. Da, da, da. Okay, here's some information on the science fair. Uh, we've had some marvelous science fairs. I uh, uh, hope everybody uh, has a chance to see things. And uh, come one, come all, and uh, make sure that you let uh, Shiloh know that you're going to... Oh, we got... Okay, we got a couple people signed up. But we need more. We got more spaces. And the Da Vinci Award, yes, for innovative um, stuff. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm 10 minutes over here. I uh, hope you enjoyed. One object and one poster, absolutely.
Okay, everybody take care. Enjoy, have a great week. I was hoping that we have thunderstorms outside. I was hoping they wouldn't interrupt our um, internet <laughs> connection while I was talking. Have a great weekend. Oh, thank you. It's fun for me. It's like, how do you tell about how computers work in one hour? <laughs> Including in history and the future. Okay, take care. Ooh, graduation day. Yep. We had ours, I think, a week ago. Thank you. Let me clean up the stage here. Phil, I love it that you're going to be so between you and Day and Delia, you guys are really going to drive the science fair and it's going to be very exciting. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. I have fun with this. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and, and your presentation and my is just, just, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Well, you know, Chantel and I uh, have even talked about maybe um, in a year's time, whoever presents the best um, slides and everything, maybe we can, I don't know, just up in the works, maybe thinking about doing an art gallery to show the slides and the whole presentation. But, you know, you are so engaging. It's wonderful to always hear you and see your slides. Thank you. It's, I, I get my fun from both uh, three ways. One is having to research it <laughs> and then giving it, but then also all the interaction. I mean, this is an international audience. How else can you do something like this with an audience that, I mean, I know there are like international conferences and stuff, but this is a one of a kind type of. Yes. And, and the That's format amazing. is too, it's very interactive for everyone saying that they're having Zoom burnout and this and that. It's because they're not interacting. And here, you know, you, you engage and you keep track of the talk and everything just fantastically, you know, and you incorporate the questions in your format. You never know what's going to happen, really. It's almost like doing a play, theater, because you never know. <laughs> and we have a very we have a very supportive um, group here, you know, where everyone will either track down the articles or make comments and everything to help expand the knowledge. It's totally marvelous, marvelous format. And and that's the other part. We do have a very interested, supportive yes. group. You're not going to see that much everywhere. There's you go on social media and you see you know snarky comments and all this stuff like that. No matter what the topic is. But sure. it's, it just makes my day to come here and see that people can be 
Oh yeah, we get such a charge out of it. And you know, I don't think anybody else has that kind of format where it's so positive and interactive and growing. It's it's totally marvelous. I keep a copy of all the chat because it's so fascinating. Oh, cool. Anyway, you have a great day. Great to see you and keep uh, keep on mulling over your Da Vinci idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, yeah, that's the next thing on my mind is I gotta go, well, how can you do one me, object cluster? <laughs> let me tell you, if, if Dave's still here, yes, he is. He wrote for professional ideas. He is, he is really, he has thrown down the gauntlet. It, what was the American Museum of Natural History in New York City? He contacted them for ideas. Yes. And so he is he is bound and determined he is going to be the Da Vinci winner this year. So you guys all have to <laughs> you're gonna be on your uh -oh. eye bar. <laughs> <laughs> he, he he already told me, he says, I'll share the idea. I said, No, make make it a surprise. But he says, I am gonna make a slide that will blow everyone away. And I said, I bet you will. <laughs> Yeah, the American Museum of Natural History, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, yes. he, he's drawing yeah. in the big wigs here. So, he essentially said, um, may the best person win, however, here's how I spell my name. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, something like that. Something like that. But I think it's going to be, you know, it's, it's dynamic. And remember, you know, I my whole thing was be as artistic and creative as possible. Da Vinci being the perfect example of, you know, uh, artistic, cerebral, uh, and scientific creativity. Anyway, I'll let you all go. It was wonderful uh, to hear you today. Thank you. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing the science uh, fair. It, it's a wonderful uh, thing that uh, we do here, and I'm glad you're um, recruiting. <laughs>